Hey guys, and welcome back to my channel. It's been a while, and this video is gonna be the one that I promised you six months ago. So this is the continuation of the topic of compliance carbon markets, and in particular, why are they being criticized? So without further ado, let's just jump into the video. The whole point of having compliance carbon markets and having this variety of mechanisms and trading systems is to allow emitters to have a choice and to be able to decrease emissions where it's easier or least costly to do so. And in theory, it looks good, but nevertheless, compliance carbon markets are still getting quite a lot of criticism. In this video, I'm going to be talking only about the main reasons for criticism, so I'm not going to be listing like the whole range of things. I mean, if you dig deep enough, you can find a lot of them. But in this video, I'm going to focus only on the main ones. And I believe in this video, it's fair to highlight three of them. Poor environmental integrity, volatile prices, and negative impact on local communities. So let's start with the first one. And to begin with, let's answer the question. What is environmental integrity? This is actually a concept that can be found in many different disciplines. Culture, law, ethics. But most often, it used to refer to the undisturbed state of natural conditions. Or, in other words, to the balanced state of nature and natural processes. And there are at least two major reasons why compliance markets do not always help to restore the balance. And the first is accounting issues. Because what happens on paper does not always correctly reflect what happened in reality. Well, let's not forget that compliance carbon markets is a relatively new mechanism. And right now, there is no even single unified international market yet. According to the 2021 status report on emission trading schemes published by International Carbon Action Partnership, as of end of January 2021, there were 24 emission trading systems in force. Eight are under development and expected to be launched in the near future and 14 more jurisdictions are considering possible creation of emission trading system. Separate systems are typically not linked and follow somewhat different rules and policies. So this leaves quite, quite an opportunity for lots of accounting issues. One of the most commonly claimed issues in this area is double counting. Double counting is basically a situation where two parties claim the same carbon removal or emission reduction towards achieving mitigation targets. For example, let's imagine I've invented a magical bacteria, or honestly, not so magical because similar projects do exist. And this bacteria feeds with carbon dioxide and converts it into something that can be stored for a long period of time so that carbon dioxide would not come back into the atmosphere anytime soon. I registered the project, did everything that has to be done and got some amount of carbon credits. And now I can sell them. There might be several situations leading to double counting. Possible situation number one. My project is located in one of developing countries and I decided to sell my carbon credits to a developed country. In this case, what often happens is that the country where my project is located calculates carbon credits from my project as part of their greenhouse gas emissions reduction effort and the country I sold carbon credits to will also count them, which means, in reality, the same carbon credits are calculated twice towards achieving the overall mitigation target. Possible situation number two. Let's imagine my project works using facilities of a much bigger laboratory and in theory what can happen is that the government of the region who sponsors the laboratory and maybe other scientific facilities that were built specifically to develop solutions to fight climate change also somehow managed to claim greenhouse gas reductions thanks to those investments. And since my little project is a part of this bigger effort, then we basically claim the same reduction twice. These are just illustrative examples, but similar situations happen and it is possible due to still raw accounting rules and approaches used on carbon markets in general. Second, it's important to use the right time frame of reductions. Often country uses 
cumulative amount of international transfers of carbon credits to count them towards fulfilling one-year target. And researchers show that this is actually not the best thing to do. And if it's going to happen on a bigger scale, then it actually might lead to the increase of global greenhouse gas emissions. Third quite common accounting issue is that countries use different methodologies to convert the reductions into greenhouse gas equivalent. As we know, there is more than just carbon dioxide in the scope of the Paris Agreement. There are also other greenhouse gases, for example methane, nitrous oxide, and more. But to track total greenhouse gas inventories of the countries, or to compare results of emissions reduction efforts, we need to be able to convert footprints of different gases into a standard unit. And this unit calls greenhouse gas equivalent, or carbon dioxide equivalent. It expresses the impact of each different greenhouse gas in terms of the amount of CO2 that would create the same amount of warming. Ratios used to convert the various gases into equivalent amounts of CO2 are based on the so-called global warming potential of each gas. It describes total warming impact relative to CO2 over a period of time. For example, methane scores 25 meaning that one ton of methane will create the same amount of warming as 25 tons of CO2. And the accounting issue we are talking about arises because different emission trading systems sometimes use different global warming potentials. It also might lead to the confusion of how much reduction actually happened in a year. The second major issue regarding environmental integrity is quality of units traded on compliance carbon markets. In the previous video, I talked about four criteria that emissions reductions have to follow to make sure that they are of high quality. And just to recap quickly, every emissions reduction have to be additional, permanent, verifiable, and something else, and real. So these are four criteria that define the quality of units traded. And if reduction falls short on one of those criteria, then it's not of high quality anymore. One of the most common reasons for criticism of quality of units is actually their additionality. Because just imagine you have to make sure that every reduction traded on the market would not have happened if the project was not capable of selling those carbon credits. So you have to make sure that reductions happened only thanks to the fact that those projects were capable of joining carbon markets. And this is extremely tricky, because right now there are massive investments into the old types of green projects, and like projects often happen not because they want to start selling carbon credits, but because in the future they're actually going to be profitable, for example, investments in the green energy solutions, right? And those projects still, right now, often can sell their carbon credits because it's quite hard to prove that projects would not have happened if not thanks to compliance carbon markets. Thus, we've covered the first major reason for criticism of compliance markets. And now let's talk about the second one, volatile prices. So why pricing is even important? The fundamental idea of carbon markets, and carbon pricing in general actually, is that the fact that companies have to pay for the right to emit, have to provide incentives for their long-term changes towards business models and technologies that produce less greenhouse gas emissions. In simple words, if a company knows that it's cheaper to rebuild its operation towards less carbon-producing structures than continue paying for emission permits and fees for non-compliance with emissions targets, then there is a good chance that company will invest in low carbon transformations. Which means, if prices are too low, it can eliminate the investment signal for low carbon technologies and can undermine the scheme's credibility. If prices are too high, it's also not so good actually, because excessive costs of compliance can erode public support for the cap and trade scheme. So for the best results, it's better to have not too low, not too high and quite stable price. Now let's have a look at the price history of the biggest compliance market. The biggest compliant market so far is European Emission Trading Scheme. For the moment, it's responsible for over 80% of turnover of all compliance markets. So the prices of this scheme are quite representative if you want to understand the overall dynamic.
The market started its operations in 2005, so we have over 15 years of pricing history. And in these 15 years, price for emission allowances behaved like this. Meaning that most of the time, the price ranged from approximately 4 to 30 euros per one emission permit. And in the last year, the price is basically tripled. So why prices are so volatile? Well, just like on many other markets in the world, prices on compliance markets are also defined by supply-demand ratio. Supply is an easy part. It's just a cap set by government and it defines number of emission permits issued. Demand is a little bit more tricky. It depends on many different factors. And most of them are either highly unpredictable or volatile. For example, after the economic crisis of 2008, the price on emission allowances fell. It happened because economic activity decreased, which led to the reduction of emissions as well. In turn, this has led to an oversupply of emissions allowances in the market. Another example is price increase in 2018-2019 due to the structural improvements of the market. Several mechanisms were introduced to increase market stability, which had a positive impact on the price dynamics. Price volatility on compliance markets is so dramatic not only because it is influenced by a large number of volatile and highly unpredictable factors, but also because this is a new market and it has a limited number of large players, which makes the risk of volatility even higher. Of course, there were attempts to make the price more stable. For example, market stability reserve was introduced to increase price stability and maintain a certain supply-demand balance by controlling the number of allowances in circulation in the market. But recent price peaks show that the stability mechanisms are still require improvements. And that was the brief diving into the topic of volatile prices. Now let's move on. Third major reason for criticism of compliance markets is that carbon offsetting projects that happen in developing countries often end up hurting local communities. Let's review an example. A forestation project in Kachung Central Forest Reserve, Uganda. At first glance, this is a great project. A company called Green Resources decided to plant 2,000 hectares of forest instead of degraded grass and shrub land. And that's what they did. And all of the carbon credits issued by the project were purchased by single buyer, Swedish Energy Agency. But later, in November 2015, Swedish Energy Agency stopped its payments, and they stated that villages were being deprived of vital resources and experienced threats and violence, and there is a lack of clarity regarding ownership in the reserve. It appeared that the land used for the project was the land villagers previously had access to, and relied upon for vital livelihood activities like growing food and grazing livestock, as well as for collecting forest resources, including firewood. So when they got cut off from this land, their lives literally were at risk. And on top of harming local communities, the project also harmed the local environment. Apparently there was a leakage of agrochemicals used in forest plantations. It led to the killing of vegetation and animals. And planted forest itself was a monoculture tree farm, which was not natural for the biodiverse ecosystem of the region. As a result, the habitat for the insects, birds and many animals was destroyed. We've talked about all three main reasons for criticism of compliance carbon markets. It's worth mentioning that on the recent climate-related event, COP26, some decisions were taken that will affect how the market operates. And I will be talking about these decisions in my next videos. Guys, thanks for watching. As always, I hope it was useful. I hope it helped you at least a little bit to get better understanding of this super complex topic of compliance carbon markets and of carbon markets in general. So stay tuned, the next video I'm gonna make is gonna be on one of the major climate-related events that happened a couple of months ago, but I'm just getting back to YouTube, so I'm gonna do the video only now, but better later than never, right? So again, thanks for watching, and I hope to see you soon, guys!